In 1845, when Charles Weber acquired a 49,000-acre parcel from his luckless business partner in exchange for paying off his grocery bill, he couldn't have anticipated what awaited him three years later. During the gold rush, Argonauts could come to Stockton en route to what were known as the Southern Mines. But the principal um, artery for transportation and the fastest way to travel was via water. There was no Stockton in those early days. There was Charles Weber's tent town on the San Joaquin River that served as a jumping off point for the gold fields. He realized that the San Joaquin River was going to be the principal aid in developing his city. And Charles Weber was able to attract enough business people to establish hotels and restaurants and freight companies, and they would cater to the wants and needs of the miners. Uh, those who did not make their fortune, uh, in many instances, had been farmers in their previous lives. And coming back into Stockton or Sacramento, took a look around the Central Valley and realized there was great agricultural potential. We're in San Joaquin County. This is the most productive agricultural area really in the world. You grow corn, wheat, almonds, walnuts, fruit, a whole host of different commodities feeding the world. You couldn't have the unique agricultural environment we have without the river. That is what allowed this state to, to turn from a gold mining state, if you will, uh, to a food state. California's Central Valley is blessed with the best soil there is. Back then, the problem was less about growing the food than it was getting it to market. Without a statewide railroad system or even decent roads, Stockton was in a strategic position to be a hub, connecting the valley by river to San Francisco. From gold rush days, riverboats carried passengers and cargo on a daily basis between Stockton, Sacramento, and San Francisco. With the Central Pacific Railroad's completion of a branch line in 1869, connecting Stockton with the Transcontinental Railroad, the city's vision as a trade and transportation hub began to materialize, except for one critical issue. There were rather tortuous waterways leading from San Francisco to Stockton, weaving and turning through the islands. And because of hydraulic mining, there was a lot of sedimentation of these river areas, and so it was becoming rather shallow. In addition, ships were getting larger with deeper drafts, leaving the river's shallow depth a barrier to ocean-going vessels. If the region was going to grow with the times, it had to tame the twisting passage through the delta. Even though no single individual gets credit for proposing a dredged shipping channel, it was Lieutenant Colonel Barton Stone Alexander who drew up the plan in 1870 that showed it was feasible. They kind of choked at the projected $8 million price tag of such a ship canal. And so it continued to be a festering problem for the city of Stockton being cut off from that ocean-going transportation. Other countries hungered for California products, not just grains, nuts, and cotton, but manufactured goods too. The opportunity for trade was undeniable. When a product moves, and how it moves, is all dependent on where the destination is. The ship behind me is actually loading rice that's going to Japan. Rice would not be able to get to Japan if it didn't use port facilities, because it doesn't make economic sense to ship the kind of tonnage that one ship can hold in another way, like say, maybe in an aircraft. Stockton's residents remained convinced their future lay in a navigable ship channel. 
1925, they passed a $3 million bond toward its construction. The state and feds later added more funds that finally set the project in motion. Work began in 1930. Dredges began removing millions of cubic yards of river bottom. Clamshell dredges piled the mud and rock to make levees that formed the new channel, opening acres of Delta Islands for farmland. Despite the Great Depression and Hitler's rise in Germany, in Stockton, church bells rang and automobile horns blared. It was 1933, and more than a thousand people celebrated the arrival of the Daisy Gray, the first deep draft vessel to arrive at Stockton's new port using the new channel. It was the start of a new era. The local responsibility was to develop the facilities. So they developed the docks, the warehousing, the rail connection, many of which we're actually still using today. In my opinion, uh, rail facilities are just as important to the success of a port as a dock. Central California Traction Company has been in business for more than 100 years. We are a uh, small railroad that basically does all the railroad switching on the Port of Stockton, and we're going all day long. We get rail cars from two major railroads, Burlington Northern and Union Pacific, and we get those cars, separate them all out, take them to the customers, let them unload them or load them, and then take them back and give them to those class one railroads. The port is a busy place. I mean, they've got ships coming in, they've got trucks coming in, and if we didn't have the railroad here, you wouldn't be able to get enough trucks in over the road infrastructure that they have. When the United States mobilized to fight in World War II, Stockton's port facility became an integral part of the war effort. The United States Army took over the port of Stockton and it became the largest vehicle and parts consignment center in the entire United States. The harbor overflowed with 10,000 workers loading merchant vessels and assembling as many as 125 ships for the war effort, from tugs to minesweepers. In 1944, the United States Navy took over what was known as Rough and Ready Island and turned it into a naval complex. And uh, they would, the Navy held on to this area up until the year 2000, when Rough and Ready Island and all of its developments were turned over to the Port of Stockton. Rough and Ready Island tripled the size of the port overnight. It added warehousing and open land that the Port of Stockton never had before. The acquisition really helped us to be able to provide additional space for tenants to develop their own projects. Yara, North America, chose this location for its central location in the valley. We were able to lease a piece of the land here and build this facility and move our operation from another location that was less profitable and less convenient, so to speak. Keeps us competitive, keeps our costs down, and keeps us profitable, which is really what we're, we're all about. The presence of global companies reflects the port's role in world commerce. Cargo crossing the docks has grown 176% in less than 10 years, making the port of Stockton the fourth busiest port in California. I've seen the port get extremely busy. I was working when there would be maybe a one ship every two, three weeks. Now we have two, three ships every day coming in. It's, it's just booming. While the port is responsive to world markets and international trade trends, it's also tied to the local community with a responsibility to its neighbors. Today, the port supports more than 10,000 jobs, what I like to call family wage jobs, to become a major part of the economic foundation of Stockton and the greater San Joaquin County area. The port actually makes a major contribution through tax revenues that go into every facet of every service that's provided by the city of Stockton 
or San Joaquin County. The port absolutely is part of the community. The waterway is not just only our, our ship channel. It is part of the Delta. It is part of the Pacific Flyway. It is a recreation area. It is a fishery. One of the latest commitments the port has made is we have joined the Green Marine Program. It looks at how ports and how uh, maritime operations are being handled to uh, reduce your impacts on the environment. At Antioch Dunes National Wildlife Refuge, we are working to restore the habitat for three species by placing sand material that comes out of our dredging each year. It's been an extremely successful project. The owls were here when we took over Rough and Ready. You know, the rodents like the uh, burrow holes in our levees, and we use the owls, the, the Air Force, if you want to call them, to uh, come in and reduce the rodent population. This wonderful group, Puentes, came to us, and they wanted to develop a community garden. And we thought it was a wonderful idea. We belong to a church in Sacramento, and a lot of the people are elderly and are really in need. So we thought once we start harvesting, we'll go and like bless people so that way the people that can't get out, they'll have their fresh veggies delivered right to them. The power of one little seed to help people live more sustainable lives. Yeah, that's our goal. It could be asked, what's a maritime port got to do with community gardening? or saving endangered species, or running a tiny service railroad, or any of a host of novel undertakings. It's being innovative. It's being responsive. It's being unique. But then, a bustling port 75 miles inland from the coast is unique. That's the Port of Stockton, cast in a different mold from its start as a gold rush depot upriver, doing what's needed to meet the challenges of its times the responsibilities as a community leader, and embracing the prospects for a bright future.